Because I, because we have judge others, and graceful God, we ask the Holy Spirit to make our blindness and deaf ears behold you, God. God, we give full attention. Our vision is to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, to follow in your spirit wherever you be. But we acknowledge your presence as Pastor Alex prepares to speak. But let his words um, speak only truth. May your face fall on this place in every shadow of our lives. As a church, let us be more like pilgrims awaiting for your return. Uh, may our hearts and mind and strength be devoted as, as one accord in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Sorry, I'm a <laughs> sensitive to where the mic is. Uh, we have the third message of our Acts series, and I have an inkling that I, I was gonna go for just you know four sermons, uh, you know, this month, but I think it's it, it may be extended a little bit. Um, but yeah, I just want to encourage you to really, um, uh, you know, delve into the book of Acts. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite books. Um, every book of the Bible is, it should be our favorite book. Um, but I think especially in this time and season of our lives, I think just going back to uh, life as it were, you know, for the apostles and the first disciples of Christ, uh, how they they lived, how they lived out uh, the grace of God and the gospel. I think it um, teaches us so much. And take this off. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, read today's passage. Hey, we'll be reading from Acts 2, uh, verse 1 through about 24. So just quickly, uh, after Jesus, uh, he rose from the dead, he reappears to the disciples for 40 days, uh, teaching them, reassuring them, encouraging them. Uh, he, he ascends, he goes back to the Father physically, and then he gives them a promise, uh, the Holy, go back to Jerusalem and, and wait for the promised gift of the Father, uh, which is the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, and, and you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses, okay? Um, so they're praying in Jerusalem in the upper room, um, and... Uh, there's a little uh, story about, if you're interested, you can go just go right back. Right before chapter 2, uh, you know, Peter reinstates one of the apostles, okay? Because, you know, obviously Judas Iscariot, he fell away uh, by betraying Jesus, and uh, they choose Matthias. And now um, it is chapter 2, verse 1. So this is about uh, after Jesus goes back, they've been in Jerusalem praying together uh, intensely, remember, with unity and perseverance for about 10 days. But they didn't know when the Holy Spirit was going to come, okay? The work of God comes into our lives suddenly many times. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them, 
and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances, gave them words, expressions. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Proselytes simply means Gentiles, you know, non Jews who have become uh, religious Jews. Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own uh, tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which is about 9, 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last, so Peter is quoting from uh, Joel chapter 2, okay, verse 38. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up losing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. This is God's word. I'll try to f follow my notes a little more closely. I, I think uh, in the last few weeks, I think I, I've been just um, been a little more spontaneous. But, you know, beginning with our theme at the beginning of the month, it was the Holy Spirit, uh, the Christian, and the church. And um, at the beginning, we, we promised, uh, uh, we talked about um, waiting for God, okay? uh, waiting for, for God. And, and last week, obviously, it was about prayer, okay? about prayer and and today, I want to talk about, I mean, it's all under the same theme, but I want to address the issue, the question of uh, what does the coming of the Holy Spirit say about us, uh, say about God, and by extension, us, okay? So I'll be answering that question with two main points. What does the coming of the Holy Spirit say about God and us? Okay, and... Point number one is uh, all that God does flows out of his keeping, okay, his own promises. Okay? All that God does okay, in this world and in our lives, it simply flows out of his keeping okay, of his own promises. And, you know, I... Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with John Wesley. You know, maybe if you have a Methodist church background, you, you might know him. He was the founder of the Methodist uh, Kamnigyo, right? Uh, he's the founder. And, you know, he was a man of prayer, and he said something like, uh, 
God does everything, or God doesn't do anything apart from the prayer of his people. Okay? God doesn't do anything apart from the prayer of his people. And so obviously he was emphasizing the importance of prayer. Right? That everything that God does, it's in response. It's an answer to God's, uh, the, people of God's, the prayer of God's people. But, you know, I want to twist that a little bit, actually. That's, that's good and that's true. But I think even more importantly, God doesn't do anything apart from his own promises. Okay? That's the truth. God doesn't do anything apart from his promises. Everything that he does okay, is in response. It's an answer to his promises. Okay? He is driven and motivated by his promises that he has made for us. And, you know... I want you to just notice something very basic, you know, in this passage, obviously we're talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It, it was the first time that the Holy Spirit was poured out in this way, okay? But the coming of the Spirit, you know, is not just some phenomenon that happened to take place, okay, at this time in this place, okay? The arrival of the Spirit came as a fulfillment of God's own promise, and this actually dates back at least uh, almost a thousand years before uh, this day of Pentecost. Because we know that Peter quoted from uh, the book of Joel. Okay? And it was written about uh, more than 800 years before okay, the birth of Jesus. More than 800 years before the birth of Jesus. And, you know, interestingly, the word, it says the, the Holy Spirit suddenly right? The Holy Spirit came or arrived, right? On the day of Pentecost. The word for arrived in Greek, it, it actually is connected to the word fulfill, okay? To fulfill. So it wasn't just, just random coming, you know? God wasn't just looking at the scene and, you know, like, I I'll see how people do. I'll see how my disciples do. And, you know, when it kind of feels like the right time, I'm going to send the Holy... No, it wasn't like that, okay? It, it, it had been pro prophesied about, for hundreds of years. So this coming of the Spirit is the precise fulfillment of God's promise generations ago. It came exactly the way that God had intended, planned, and now executed. You know, and as I was thinking about this, you know, I was just imagining, um, I mean, just think of that window of time, right? almost a thousand years at least, okay? And, and many scholars actually say the prophecy and the promise of the coming spirit, it actually goes further back, okay, to the time of uh, Ezekiel and even Exodus because, you know, this happened on the day of Pentecost, okay, which was 50, day, 50 days after the Passover and also it was a day of what's called the Feast of Harvest, okay? This was a day in the Old Testament when God commanded, bring in your first fruits, of your first harvest, okay? And that really is of symbolic meaning, okay? The souls that were harvested, you guys know Peter preaches, right? And we didn't read it, but at the end, 3,000 people, right? They're cut to the heart, and they say, what must we do? And Peter says, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus and be baptized. So that was the ingathering of the first fruits of souls, okay? So th these illusions, I mean, it, it's been going on for thousands of years, and I was just thinking about, wow, during that time, imagine billions and trillions of, of different human factors, okay? That could have messed it all up, okay? We're, we're talking about especially human sins. You, you, we know the history of the Israelites, just like us, right? They were prone to wonder and, and sin, and they, they turned to themselves. They wanted to live their lives, okay, according to their own desires. But God you know, made a promise, right? and, and for thousands of years, nothing could get in the way of this precise fulfillment of God's promise. So nothing, you know, rendered God's promise void, even their sins and history of disobedience. So it came uh, at this exact time, in this exact place, in this exact manner, because God made a promise. So we know what we see is uh, through history, through every human factor, that God is totally in control and in charge. 
because of his own goodness and, and love for us who are his children. And you know, we really have to think about this one because I know, you know, intellectually, theologically, you know, that, that sounds right. But I think a lot of times we really don't get a hold of this truth, you know, in a, in a deep way. Because if you really believe, understand and believe this about God, that all that he does is, is driven and motivated by his own promises and that he never fails right, to keep his promises, then it really brings stability to your life and to your soul. Because it means that everything that God does... It's, it's always in keeping, in fulfillment of what he has promised for our best as his children. So, you know, as we read in that verse, right? Um, I mean, everything happened, including, right, the handing over of Jesus, his crucifixion. It, was, it all happened according to what? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. So what it means for us is that nothing that happens in our lives, okay, in the past, present, and future, nothing is outside of his definite plan and foreknowledge. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's an encouraging thought, isn't it? That nothing in this world and in our lives, there's nothing that God is not prepared for. Okay? There's nothing that God doesn't have a plan and a promise for. So what God is doing is he's simply right, unfolding his promises. Okay? He is carrying out, he's working out his promises in our lives. Okay? And, and the scriptures are clear. Right? Once he set his mind to do something, right, nothing can stop him. Everything is coming together in our lives, okay? even when we don't understand, okay? even when it's painful, even when we don't agree. Okay, even when we don't like it, it's coming together. Okay? All things work together to fulfill his promises in our lives. Okay? So that, that's point number one. Okay? That all that God does, it flows out of his commitment okay, to keep his promises for us. And, and number two, I know that was like unusually short. My point number two is longer. I always like to keep the, the suspense. <laughs> Point number two. God, I, again, it's, I'm answer, trying to answer the question, what does the coming of the Holy Spirit say about God and us? Okay. What, does the Holy, what does the coming of the Holy Spirit say about God and us? Number two is, the answer is, God, the Bible says, is a consuming fire, okay? a consuming fire of holiness. But instead of being a consuming fire and consuming us, okay? destroying us, he rather consummates us to himself. Okay? Instead of consuming us in his holy wrath, he cons consummates us to himself in love. You guys know the word consummate. It means, uh, come on, translators. It's, it's that, in Korean, anybody knows? It, it, it's, it's uniting yourself, right? It's the unity between the husband and wife, okay? And, and not just, I'm not just talking about sexual uni union, but in every way, right? Emotionally, spiritually, it's, it's coming together as one. That is consummation, okay? And, you know, I, I want you to, uh, you know, notice the language of, of this verse. You know, go back to the text Okay, verse, um, verse 3 from verse 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, you know, this, this language... Uh, it's it's very uh, it, it's very interesting. It's it's you know if you look at the original language, you know the Holy Spirit coming and and resting. Literally, it really means to to sit, okay, to sit. 
And the thing about it is, you know, you only sit down when you intend to stay in that place. Right? You only sit, you know, when you intend to stay. So what we see here is God's presence, you know, his life, his power are now here to dwell and to stay and abide in all believers' lives once and for all. Okay. And, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, just one Old pas uh, Testament passage. You know, I like to, uh, you know, bring us back to the Old Testament because I know most of us, we don't like to read our Old Testament. But we can appreciate what the New Testament says, okay, without going back to the Old Testament. I'll just show you one passage. Uh, let's go to uh, the book of Numbers. And what I'm trying to show you is that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit okay, in the New Testament is, is, is different, is distinct from the Spirit coming upon just a certain leader or a select group of people in the Old Testament. Okay, there's a difference. Okay, let's go to Numbers chapter 11. Okay, verse 26. Numbers 11 and 26. So this is the time of Moses. You know, Moses was uh, a, a prophet, a leader for the Israelites. And it's talking about, you know, Moses had such a demand on him, you know, because he had to, you know, rule and, and decide on all social and civil matters for the Israelites. A million, okay, or more people at the time. So God actually makes a provision and he actually allows him to select, okay, uh, 70 leaders, okay, 70 elders. Actually, we'll read from uh, uh, verse 24, sorry, verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tents. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, to Moses, and took some of the spirits that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Med Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Okay, a very interesting passage. Okay, because you got to notice the kind of language that is being employed. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. Okay, it's not some magical force like the force in Star Wars. Okay, the Holy Spirit is a person. Actually, we have to get this clearly. The Holy Spirit is God's. Okay. Trinity doesn't mean that God is divided up into three, okay? It's a mystery, right? Each person is fully God. Jesus is a son of God relationally, but he's God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, but he's God. It's a person. But here it says the Lord would, what? He, or he put, he took some of the spirit that was on Moses, right? And put it on the 70 elders, okay? So why this kind of language? And I would say because okay, the Old Testament, you know, the Holy Spirit who wrote the te Old Testament through the people, he's trying to show that the Spirit's empowerment in the Old Testament was rather passive, okay, impersonal, uh, partial, unlimited, okay, indirect. Okay? Because what we see is the 70 elders, okay, they got some of the spirit, and they prophesied, but, but they stopped. And interestingly, interestingly, at the end, you know, there are others who are prophesying. And Moses says, right, and Moses doesn't stop them. And he says, okay, don't you know that God's desire, his heart, 
is for all God's people basically to receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, Moses doesn't have the New Testament understanding, but by the Holy Spirit's inspiration, he's being led right, to the promise of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. So what we see is this kind of uh, limited anointing okay, in the Old Testament. It's, it's a repeated pattern in the Old Testament. Okay, that's what I'm trying to say. The Holy Spirit would only come upon certain people and only in a limited way. Okay? But what we have in Acts 2, obviously there's a contrast. Okay? Um, go back to verse, verse 2. What does it say? There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested, rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the difference is now it's the Spirit himself in person who comes, okay, directly from heaven, right, in full power, like a mighty rushing wind. And he sits on the believers and gives them utterance. And, and it's very interesting, you know, Peter now, he's being divinely guided by the Holy Spirit, okay? And you got to understand, Peter was a fisherman, okay? And it means that he's not the, the religious elite. He's not like a Pharisee or a teacher of the law. Yet he is inspired by the Holy Spirit to quote from Joel chapter 2, okay? And it says that, the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Okay? Not just on some special people okay? among the Israelites. It says that your sons and daughters will prophesy and even the male and female servants will prophesy. By the way, you know, just a little break. Prophesy. Okay? We don't have time to go into this topic. Okay? It, it can be a controversial topic, but biblically, uh, what we have in the context of the book of Acts, what does it mean to prophesy? You know, you guys hear, you know, that word gets thrown around sometimes, you know, the prophetic, you know, prophetic word or prophetic gifting. And I do believe that the New Testament testify to its operation, continued operation today. But just to give it, just to clear it up, to prophesy means to give divinely guided utterance and words that speak and testify about the works of God, okay? By the spontaneous leading of the Holy Spirit, okay? To prophesy means to give divinely guided utterance and words that speak and testify about the works of God by the spontaneous leading of the Holy Spirit. By spontaneous, I mean it is sensitive to the moments in time, okay? And, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, you only think about, you know, prophesying means like you uh, foretell, right? You tell something about the future, but not necessarily, okay? It can be predictive, okay, in nature. But also what we see in the book of Acts, okay, when uh, Peter is quoting from Joel chapter 2, okay, by divine inspiration, okay, he is in some sense prophesying, okay? He is gaining an understanding, a revelation, that he cannot have in the natural, okay, by his education and backgrounds. Prophesying can be in the form of preaching, okay. Um, there can be a, a sense, a guidance from the Holy Spirit as preachers preach the Word of God that is uh, divinely guided, okay, supernatural. Not just human words and human wisdom, uh, but from the Spirit. But either way, okay, just going back, the point of the Joel passage here is that God's, you know, the Spirit's anointing and indwelling is for, it's pretty clear, for all believers now, okay? And I know we take this for granted, but for the Jews at this time, okay, who had an Old Testament kind of understanding, I mean, this was the most revolutionary thing, okay? They, they, all, they always had this concept of the Holy Spirit empowering and anointing only, right, the special people. It was not available for all people, but it says that it's for all flesh now, right? Not obviously not every human being, but all God's children, all believers, all Christians. Okay? 
So the Spirit's indwelling presence and power is now in us, fully active and direct, okay, personal, complete, and unlimited. Okay. And I think, you know, we take this for granted, right? I mean, you read the Old Testament and, I mean, you look at the prophets, right? you look at David, you look at people like Samson. I mean, they're, right, divinely empowered, right? They, they do crazy exploits. But somehow, you know, the Bible is saying that the same spirit in a greater way, okay, has been poured out on us and now lives in us. You know, we kind of feel like, yeah, you know, I guess, but I got to, right, I got to move on with my life. I feel so uh, ordinary. But I, I want us to understand that the promises of God, it, we, we shouldn't take this for granted. And, and you know, I, I believe that God is, you know, awakening his church and teaching us, okay, what it means to have the Holy Spirit okay, indwell us. And I know it's a pro learning process. There's learning curves. But I, I just want us to be encouraged to, to seek the Holy Spirit. You know, many of you guys, you know, I'm just kind of going on a tangent, but Many of you guys, you know, we, we, we struggle, you know, in our Christian walk. You know, we try to read the Bible and we try to be faithful with what we know. Um, but I know a lot of times, I mean, even for pastors, you'll be surprised. Okay? Not every day is a sunny day, okay, spiritually speaking. And, and we, we, we try to be faithful. Okay? But I would say the reason why a lot of times, you know, we feel dry and, you know, we just, we're just kind of going through the motions. It's, be, it's not because the Holy Spirit doesn't want to fill us, okay? It's because we either uh, underappreciate or, or we don't under understand the significance, okay? The role of the Holy Spirit. We need to ask the Holy Spirit's empowerment again and, and again in our lives. And, you know, just going back to this um, theme of consummation, okay? And, and I really believe you know, there, there, the Holy Spirit, I know, you know, the language is kind of abstract, you know. But what the Holy Spirit has done, if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, okay. What the Holy Spirit has done is, is so profound because, you know, it, it, really, it really means that now we have full access to God. That even the Old Testament prophets didn't have, okay. David was a man after God's own heart. But he, doesn't, he didn't have the Holy Spirit available to him the way that we have. So in one sense, he didn't have full access to God, but we do. Okay? Through the Holy Spirit, we have full intimacy with God. We have the consummation of a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. And, you know, you know this is a... What we have is, I know we don't always experientially have this, okay? But what has been done through the Holy Spirit is now, okay, we are included, okay? We are swept up, okay, in the fellowship of the Trinity itself, okay? Between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, the Bible says that we have been united with Christ, okay? And now, right, the Father being in the Son, the Son being in the Father, and the same thing for the Holy Spirit. Now we are in the fellowship of the Trinity. So what I want us to really begin to understand deeply is that, you know, the Holy Spirit is it, not just some, like, thing, okay, that's in the air. Okay, and then sometimes he helps us a little bit. Okay, sometimes, you know, he seems to be silent and distant. The Holy Spirit is always with us. Okay, the Bible says that he is a seal, okay? the sealing of what's to come, the guarantee, a guarantor of our inheritance. So through the Holy Spirit, what we have is the most intimate type of union with Christ. It's an insepar inseparable union, right? Unbreakable, covenantal, okay? unconditional, and eternal, a binding union between a husband and a wife. And, you know, what I want us to see is that, 
even though you know, we take this for granted and it just seems like a pretty metaphor, the Bible actually says that this is something that even angels long to look into, okay? According to 1 Peter 1.12, okay? It says, even angels longed to look into these things. And, and you got to stop, you know, why, why would angels long to see something, okay? In, in a sense, they have a greater revelation of, of God's glory, okay? They're in the presence of God. But there's something that makes them long, okay? To look into, to understand. And, and in that context, you know, those things that angels throughout the ages have longed to look into is, is what we have today, okay? Things that have been fulfilled through Jesus Christ, whose death on the cross for our sins not only washed away our guilt, but also gave us the right okay, to be God's children and to receive the Holy Spirit himself. So, you know, it, it's, it, we just got to stop and think um, that God, this infinite God, okay, is, is living inside of me. Okay? And if you know about the Puritans, you know, they, they had a little book called The Life of God in the Soul of a Man. Okay? That's how they like to put it, The Life of God in the Soul of a Man. And, you know, one reason we take this for granted, right? One reason this doesn't really move us, I believe, is because uh, we don't understand the depth and the extent of God's holiness okay, in the Bible. And, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, without taking too much, I'll just give you a few uh, examples, right? And, and I know we kind of have a theological construct of God's holiness, but the best way is to go back to the examples of the Bible, okay? And you guys remember in the Old Testament, you know, God's holiness was manifested, but in limited ways, okay? We're talking about not, not the fullness of God's holiness, but limited, okay? Partial manifestations of his holiness. But we see that, you know, God's holiness in the Old Testament, even though they were just uh, little glimpses, right? They were so holy, okay? That it was actually fatal, right? You guys remember? So every time uh, people came into the presence of God inappropriately, okay, uh, that they would die, and it doesn't mean they, you know, went to hell. That's for another discussion that we can have, okay, after the sermon. But think of the Israelites. You know, you guys remember, you can read in Exodus chapter 19, okay, when God was meeting Moses on Mount Sinai, okay, uh, God actually gave a command, okay, okay, Moses, don't allow anyone from the camp to come and touch uh, the mountain, okay? And, and if they were to do so, uh, you are supposed to, you, you are to punish them uh, by, not punish actually, put them to death, okay? Uh, you know, a verse in Exodus 19 says, the people stood far off, okay, from the presence of God. They came on Mount Sinai, okay? And it says, they were afraid and they trembled and they said to Moses, do not let God speak to us lest we die, okay? That's the sense that the people had about the presence of God. You know, think of uh, Aaron's sons. Okay? You know, Moses' cousin Aaron was a high priest. You know, his sons in uh, Leviticus chapter 10, okay? he had two eldest sons named Nadab and Abihu. Okay? They come into the temple, okay? and they're carrying out you know, their whatever daily duties in the temple. And they actually choose to bring in their own fire that was unconsecrated. Okay? And they... And, 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 you know, scholars still debate what, what, what there really was. But what we know is that they bring in this unconsecrated, unauthorized fire, okay? And they offer incense to God, okay? It's not like they were trying to do something bad, right? They offer incense to God, but it was human initiative. Okay? It's, it's what they thought was okay and right. And what happens is when they offer that uh, incense, uh, they are struck dead, Okay, in the temple. You know, another interesting example, you guys know um, the story of Uzzah, okay? First Chronicles 13, if you want to read. You know, they were moving the Ark of God, okay? And, you know, uh, something happens. I mean, it seems to be an accident, 
Okay? And the Ark of God, right, which represented the presence of God that the Israelites carried, you know, it gets destabilized. I don't know, someone stumbled, right? The people who were, who were carrying it. So it was, it's about to fall to the ground, and this, this na guy named, we don't know much about him, Uzzah, right, who was in, in that procession. You know, he, he reaches out, and okay, oh, the Ark of God is about to call. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch it. I'm going to stabilize it, prevent it from falling to the ground, because that's not good. Okay? But actually, God had commanded, every Israelite knew that okay, only, okay, only the priests okay, could handle the Ark of God. So when Uzzah, who was not a priest, touches the Ark of God, Okay, he is struck dead, okay, right in the presence of the people. Just, you know, one, one more example. I know these, maybe this is not a review. Is it interesting? <laughs> uh, Exodus chapter 28 and 39, you know, it describes um, what the high priest wore, okay, when they were going into the Holy of Holies in the temple. It, it was the holiest part of the temple, it actually says they had uh, bells, okay, tied to their garment, okay, the high priest. And, and, and it's kind of weird, like, it, when you first read that, it's like, okay, what, what are the best bells for? Is it just for, like, decoration? Okay. But interestingly, um, Jewish tradition, okay, uh, ancient Jewish tradition actually says they also, with the bells, they also had a, a rope, okay, tied to them. So they, if I'm a high priest, I would have a, a, a rope that's tied around my waist. And then I would go into the Holy of Holies. And the question is, okay, what were the bells and the rope for? Okay? And, you know, Jewish understanding is that they actually understood that uh, if the high priest was improperly, uh, you know, they went through a lot of rituals and cer you know, ceremonies to be ritually clean, right, ceremonially clean because that symbolized the inner holiness, right? Inner purity. But the thing is, if, if, they, if they miss something, okay? Let's say they, they make a mistake and they forget to do uh, one little uh, ceremonial cleansing. And if I step into the Holy of Holies and, and I am ceremonially, ceremonially unclean, okay? Uh, I would drop dead immediately, okay? As I step into the Holy of Holies, so, the, the, you know, Jewish uh, rabbis, that's, that's what they thought. Because with the bells, okay, you, you listen. So you're outside, the, outside of the Holy of Holies and you're listening for the sounds, okay? And if you hear the bells, a, a sudden, right, like a dropping sound of the bells or, or the lack of the sound after, right, the high priest drops dead, then you use the rope to pull them out, okay, out of the Holy of Holies, get the dead body out, and the question is, okay, like, okay, enough of examples, right? It's like, why, why is it so severe and, and harsh, right? I, I, you know, sometimes come back to this theme, you know, we think of the God of the Old Testament as an angry, you know, wrathful God. But, you know, I want to I wanna argue for this, that the question in our, in our mind is, okay, so what, what's going on with all of those? You know, it, it, it seems like God is just, just mad, okay? Does he want to just kill everyone, okay? And you might feel, you might have that kind of, that fear, right? Okay, like, when I'm not living out my Christian life, okay, when I'm not walking in holiness and purity, you know, is there this sense of, like, okay, I'm not so sure if God, right, loves me. Okay, I'm not so sure if God is angry at me. And you, you have that fear, I think, a lot of us. But, you know, I, I just want to tell you that, you know, these examples in the Old Testament, they were temporary in the sense, okay, God's holiness doesn't change, okay? It's not like God's holiness is diminished in the New Testament. But, you know, these were temporary exceptions, okay, to display God's utter holiness and transcendence. Okay? in the most stark and unmistakable way. Okay? You know, so if you uh, just, you know, imagine with me, if you were to um, interview the Israelites back in these times, okay, like, what do you think about God, you know, with a mic? Or let's say you take a little child, a five-year-old child, and you ask the question, tell us, like, what is God, Yahweh, like? Okay? 
And the five-year-old Hebrew child would say, without skipping a breath, God is holy. Right? Even the little child knew that. So, you know, we kind of assume, okay, so the people, you know, the Israelites, the people of God, you know, they understood, they had a clear understanding of God's holiness. But, but, that's, but that's the catch. The irony is that, just think about the history of the Israelites, okay? After God had shown them his, his utter holiness, his fatal holiness, again and again, after witnessing all that, you know, do they actually obey and live in obedience? Do they live in accordance with God's re revealed laws, which were actually for their own good? Okay? God doesn't get anything out of people's obedience and keeping of the law. Right? It was actually for their right, goods, for their souls to flourish, for their community life to flourish. Instead of seeing you know, obedience as we do often in our own lives, okay? even as we claim to know God's holiness and, uh, and understand his love, just like the Israelites, you know, they, over thousands of years, I mean, it's almost like, it's like clockwork. You know, they go back again and again and again, okay, without fail, to worshiping idols and, and totally disregarding the laws of God. Okay. But what we see is God, even though he disciplines them okay, to, to bring them back into holy living and into right relationship with him, okay, God nonetheless disciplines them in love. He has compassion on them and mercy on them. He eventually forgives them and restores them every single time. He, he loved them and, and preserved them. He's still, he's still doing that, okay? even though now we are the people of God. So, you know, the, the question is, in reality, the question we have to ask is, is God the one who is severe and harsh to us? Or is it us who are severe and harsh to God? Okay? by often breaking his heart, painting his heart, by despising his grace and mercy, okay? by living in disobedience and negligence. So I think that has to be turned around. Okay? It's, it's, it's the other way around. God is not the harsh one. Okay? We are the one right, who is often, who are often harsh to God. You know, this brings back to the last uh, part of my second point. That, you know, that God, instead of consuming us, you know, in his, in his wrath and holiness, he consummates us, he has consummated us to himself in love. And obviously that's because of what Jesus has done for us. Okay. You know, John 14, 23 says, you know, Jesus speaking, we will come to him, okay, to him, to, to us, the believers, and make our home with him. It's very interesting language. It's a Trinitarian language, right? Talking about Jesus himself, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We will come and make our home with him, make our home with, with us. So what we have is with all of our known and unknown sins, right? All of our past sins, all of our present sins, all of our future sins, you know, all of our pride, okay? All of our unforgiveness, selfishness, right? All of our lusts. Right? Impure thoughts. All of our complaining and, and lukewarmness to God, toward God. It means that God saw right through all of that, okay? From before eternity passed. And what God said is, yes, I, I see all of that in your life, Alex. But I'm going to make a way to redeem you and unite you to myself. You know, I'm going to send my son to die for your, and pay for your sins then I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live in you, okay, forever. So you're going to be my son and daughter. And what God is saying is, and, and none of this is because of your own doing or choosing, okay? You don't choose me, but, but I choose you. You're not committed to me, but I'm committed to you. God is saying I know, to us that I, that I love you, and I'm going to make you worthy of my holy presence, and, and I think, uh, you know, I think Christianity in, in some ways has become so trivialized in the sense that, yes, 
You know, God is, I mean, people's faith, even non-Christians, they know the verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only one and son, right? And, and that God is love. But the thing is, um, the reason why that instead of consuming us, okay, instead of destroying us, that he can consummate us to himself in love is because of the payment that Jesus paid right, on our behalf. So God's, you know, encouragement for all of us today is, um, you know, you may be um, in difficult circumstances of your life. You may be struggling, okay, with a lot of things. But, but God is saying, you know, I will finish the work that I've started in you, okay, even before you were born. Okay, I have committed, my, committed myself to you. I have set my affections on you, okay. And, and nothing that you do, okay, none of your failures, can alter that ultimately. And I think it's just a beautiful picture, right? It's, uh, I mean, you want to talk about the Old Testament God. It's actually the Old Testament God who is described as okay, the husband okay, whose wife is, is a prostitute, right? You know, um, Gomer, right? And Hosea. And, and God is, is really uh, coming after us as, as a husband, okay? Not, not to be condescending, right? He, he's not trying, he doesn't redeem us and say, you know, look what great uh, thing that I've done for you, okay? But instead, you know, he pursues us in love, okay? And, and, and you know, as Hosea okay, went for Gomer, he's, he's chasing after us, to make us holy and blameless, okay? And, you know, I, I just want us to be, you know, encouraged in that this coming of the, you know, we'll have a couple more um, sermons, obviously, you know, in this theme of the Holy Spirit, the Christian, and the church. But, you know, I want us to be encouraged that, um, you know, we, we really have to begin, we really have to go back, and, and, and th think about this, okay? What does the coming of the Holy Spirit mean? Okay? What does it say about God? And what does it say about us? Okay? And, and if, this, if all of this is true about the Holy Spirit, the next question to ask is, do I have the reality of, the reality of this Holy Spirit okay? active and operative in my own life? Okay? And, I mean, that's the tendency, right? We just you know, look at the Bible and say, we just draw the line and say, yeah, like, good for them, okay? But, you know, it's not, it hasn't happened in my life. You know, it's not going to happen in my life. But I, I really don't want us to miss out on what Jesus has already purchased for us, the promises and the inheritance. You know, I want to read from, just in closing, I want to read from... Um, Luke, okay, Dr. Luke, you know, he was a physician who also wrote the book of Acts. He writes in Luke chapter 18, okay, 18 verse 7. He's recording the words of Jesus who gave the parable about, you know, the unjust judge, right? And, and, and the widow who keeps asking for justice. Okay, Luke chapter 18 verse 7 says, Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, that's, that last verse, I know it has always uh, spoken to my wife too, but it's always spoken to me. It's very strange when the Son of Man comes. And, and that's actually the context of Joel, right, that Peter quoted too. It's talking about, you know, the blood, the moon, right, the vapor, the smoke, right, signs above the heaven and under. It's talking about the, the day of the Lord, right, the coming judgment. And in the same context, it says, when he comes, will he find faith on earth? I mean, isn't that, 
look at look around the world. how many churches do we have how many christians do we seem to have but there's something about the heart of god that knows okay the unfaithfulness of his people not just unfaithfulness okay but what we are really missing out on okay but by not pursuing what god has given us in fullness that comes through the holy spirit so you know um as we just go into a time of prayer, I, I want us to um, just, just pray about about the reality of our Christian life. You know, regardless of what sin we're struggling with, regardless of every struggle and every brokenness in our lives. You know, the gospel is clear in that Jesus paid for it. Okay. For every sin, for every struggle, every brokenness, he has paid for it to be forgiven, to be redeemed, and to be, to be used for his glory. And, you know, in light of this display of God's power, in the book of Acts. And, and the disciples, especially Peter, who had lost his, his calling as the leader figure of the disciples, we, we see him being reinstated in his calling. He's, he's walking his calling out. He's living it out. So the one who denied Jesus three times first after bluffing about his faithfulness to God, to Jesus, he's the one who stands up and, and he addresses those thousands of, of men. And, and, and he steps into his calling because the Holy Spirit came as a fulfillment to God's promise according to his definite plan and foreknowledge. So I just want us to examine our lives and, and, and see that, you know, we have a lot of things that we're dealing with, dealing with and we, we have to worry about. But in the midst of it all, is my chief desire is my deepest longing going after the, the fullness of what God has won for me what Jesus has purchased by the payment of his blood is, is the Holy Spirit just, just a word that I use is it just a word that is in the Bible is Acts chapter 2 just a, just a chapter in the Bible that is, that is trapped, that has no real bearing and relevance on my life. And, and, and the word of God, it, it comes like a fire. The man who heard the, the gospel being preached from Peter's lips, you know, what they said was, the, it, the Bible says they were cut to the heart and they said, what must we do? How must we live now? And, and the cutting of the heart is not only the challenge and the conviction, but it is the, lo the love of God setting us free and, and healing us. So as we examine our lives and hearts and ask the question, is, is this Holy Spirit fully alive and active in my thought life, in my emotional life, in my physical life. If we feel like there is a, a chasm, a, a gap, a distance between the reality of the Holy Spirit's fullness in the book of Acts and our lives, you know, let, let's pray that God would speak to us and, and he would convict our hearts that we would long for, for this power, for, for this joy, just like the disciples 
these 120 people who, who are so afraid and they were all hiding when Jesus was put to death, now they're out in the open and they're fearlessly joyful. They're, un they're uncontrollable because now they know the uncontrollably, uncontrollably good news. They know, they have an assurance about the love of the Father. They have an assurance about the sovereignty of God's power now because of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask for that, that, same, that, that, that same longing and hunger that were, that were in the disciples as they were waiting and as they received the Holy Spirit. So can we just pray for that right now? Let's, let's ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to us so that we, we can begin to hunger and thirst for the Spirit's greater manifestation in our lives. So let's pray, Jason.